Thank you very much. Um, I first wanted to thank President Dumont and the Métis Nation BC for having the confidence in me to speak today. I also wanted to mention as a housekeeping item that President Dumont was elected by a province-wide election. So each citizen, Métis citizen, above 18 years of age was entitled to cast a vote in that election. And as a result, he has the authority to speak on behalf of Métis citizens throughout British Columbia. Unfortunately, I do not. Um, but I will be discussing my views regarding some of the challenges and advances that I see within the Métis Nation. So today, the Métis Nation is represented at the national level by the Métis National Council. And to begin discussions, I feel it's important to add some context. So Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982 recognized and affirmed the existing Aboriginal and Treaty rights of the Aboriginal people in Canada. In March of 1983, the Métis Nation separated from the Native Council of Canada to form the Métis National Council, a Métis-specific national representative body. In 2002, the Métis Nation adopted its national definition of Métis, which is Métis means a person who self-identifies as Métis, is distinct from other Aboriginal people, is of historic Métis Nation ancestry, and who is accepted by the Métis Nation. So there are a number of contemporary challenges that I see facing the Métis Nation today. Internally, within the National Council, there is the challenge to adopt a national constitution, to have a direct election of the national president by citizens of the Métis Nation, and the interoperability of citizenship registries across the homeland. Externally, I see the challenge of educating Canadians about the unique history and identity of the Métis. Now, this is significant and a pressing challenge as lack of awareness negatively impacts Métis on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, within industry consultations, health and public education, there's often a lack of understanding of who the Métis are. And which leads to there's the continual challenge of defending Métis distinction in contrast to Métis simply being a mixed Aboriginal people. However, some of the contemporary advances that I see for the Métis Nation, uh, first has been the Supreme Court of Canada's 2003 ruling, R.V. Powley. Now, I consider this a major advance for two reasons. For one, it was the first case that the Supreme Court of Canada recognized Métis as being a rights-bearing Aboriginal people. And second, that the court's decision was compatible with the 2002 national definition. Another contemporary advance is the 2008 signing of the Métis Nation Protocol between the Métis National Council and the Government of Canada. This protocol was renewed in 2013 and included a Governance and Financial Accountability Accord. Together, the protocol and accord have provided opportunities for the Métis Nation to address some internal challenges, specifically regarding distinction in bilateral agreements with the federal government and also the development of the common standards for Métis Nation citizenship registries across the homeland. Métis Nation British Columbia. To begin, Métis Nation British Columbia is a democracy. Elected leaders throughout the province meet and propose legislation that is subsequently voted on by the General Assembly, which is comprised of Métis citizens. Currently, 17.2% of self-identified Métis within the province have registered as citizens with Métis Nation BC. MNBC citizenship cards are issued under the authority of our Citizenship Act. This means that the registration process follows the guidelines and requirements set by the Citizenship Act, ensuring that each card-carrying citizen of the Métis Nation has completed an objectively verifiable process. Contemporary challenges I see are both internal and external. Internally, a significant challenge is to close the gap between self-identifying Métis within the province and the number of registered citizens. A further internal challenge has to do with engaging Métis to become involved with their local chartered communities. Now, this challenge is significant because of the democratic nature of our governance structure. Externally, there is the challenge to gain the recognition that citizens of the Métis Nation are the rights-bearing Métis. Typically, this recognition has came through self-assertion and litigation. However, as the interest in Métis has increased over the last decade, I see the real challenge being that we need to promote the fact that Métis governing members of the national councils operate objectively verifiable Métis identification registries. In other words, there's no grandfathering of membership or citizenship. There's no attestation or notarized statements asserting Métis heritage. 
that each card-carrying citizen has proved that they meet the national definition. Some of the contemporary advances that I see within the Métis Nation BC is uh, with, an, with an average of nearly 150 citizenship applications received by MNBC for processing each month, there's a significant interest in Métis registration. Further, organizations are recognizing MNBC-issued citizenship cards. For example, um, MNBC card-carrying citizens gain free admission to both the Royal BC Museum Archives as well as Jasper National Park. Now, to begin, um, this is uh, Daniels and Beyond. So I'm going to presume that most people listening will have a basic understanding of what the Daniels case is about. And therefore, I'll not be spending too much time reviewing the case. However, as with most things, I believe that context is important. So under the Constitution Act of 1867, the powers of the federal and provincial governments were divided. Since then, the federal government of Canada has maintained jurisdiction over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. In 1939, the Inuit were included as Indians according to Section 9124 of the Constitution Act of 1867. Currently, Inuit are not registered under the Indian Act and remain culturally distinct from First Nations. I see the challenge with Daniels as a possible identity concern. For example, without resolution over jurisdiction, as we've seen in Cunningham, uh, Métis identified culturally as Métis but had legally accepted Indian status to obtain health benefits if not afforded to the Métis. If that were the case, Métis would be forced into the pragmatic choice of choosing either Métis cultural identity or obtaining the often necessary programs afforded by the Indian Act. Despite Métis being taxpaying citizens in the largest single Aboriginal nation in North America, Métis do not receive comparable organizational funding as First Nations or Inuit based on the population of our nation. Or to say it another way, Métis are challenged because we have insufficient control of how our tax dollars are spent on our own people. However, some of the contemporary advances that I see begin with the strong leadership and success of Métis in the courts, which has placed the Métis Nation in a favorable position within the Aboriginal landscape of Canada. And I am optimistic that the relationship between the Métis Nation leadership and the Government of Canada has nearly reached a point of nation-to-nation -nation dialogue. For example, as part of their election campaign, the Liberals promised several important commitments that were specific to the Métis Nation. For example, a review of existing federal programs and services available to the Métis Nation, a renewal of the ASETS program, which is the Aboriginal Strategic Employment and Training Strategy, which is done on a nation-to-nation -nation and distinctions-based approach, as well as converting current year funding made available to provincial Métis communities for Métis identification and registration to a permanent initiative. So we have reason for optimism. And I wanted to thank you again for allowing me to present today.